Now, today, uh, the topic says understanding Chinese and the Western cultural differences. I have to uh, have something to confess. The original of this title, I put it instead of Chinese, I put it down as Asian, A-S-I-A-N. I changed it. Do you know why? Because I want to be more specific. Because Asian, the word A-S-I-A-N, I always spell it out because I have a bit of accent. I don't know if you notice that. And when people would listen to me Asian, they thought A-C-I-E-N-T. <laughs> so I said, okay, I spell it out. But you know what I'm talking about. Um, because Asian encompasses India, right? Which is not, I'm not going to talk about because I don't know anything about the Indian culture. And it also account Pakistanis, Japanese, Korean, Miramar. No, I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about Chinese because I was born in Hong Kong as a Chinese person to a very traditional household. My father come from my side, come from a long train of Chinese scholars. I was educated that way. And also when I said Chinese, I'm talking about Chinese culture, not Chinese as a race. I'm talking about people who are culturated in the Chinese traditional teachings. I'm not talking about someone who is simply yellow skin with a Chinese last name like Chan or first name like Tang. So it's not about ethnicity. So when I talk about today in this particular workshop with you, I call it a workshop, I'll explain it, that I'm not talking about people who are yellow skin or a Chinese last name that's going to behave that way. No. I am talking about people who grew up taught in the very sort of no Chinese way, or grew up and taught and culturalized in a Chinese traditional milieu. That's what I'm talking about. And when I talk about culture, now people who are in the know know that culture is made up of what? Made up of arts, performing arts, or the literal literature, languages and also culinary food, right? And music and so on and so forth, or movies. I'm not talking about those kind of highbrow culture. What I'm talking about are how people behave culturally. So more about cultural behavior, more about when you're talking to someone who's acculturated as a Chinese person, again, not ethnically or racially Chinese person, but someone who is acculturated in that traditional Chinese culture, how they would most likely to behave. And so the purpose of the presentation today is to deepen our understanding of the differences between Chinese culture and the Western culture. Now, I got to qualify it. I look at the faces here. Most of you looks Western to me. So who am I, this yellow skin, Chinese sounding last name, speaking English with a, a, a Chinese accent to qualify to talk about the Western culture? I have not gone to school to study Western culture. I have not read a lot of books about Western culture. So who is this qualified to talk about that? So let me tell you, I think I'm qualified because I've worked with and live with so many of people who are, again, not by face, but again, because of you are acculturated in the Western culture. Obviously, my personal experience could be wrong, right? Because I haven't seen everybody. So today's talk is based more on my personal experience. But you probably would disagree with me on some of the statements I make, because you are one of the society. You may say, Tan, you're full of it. Western people don't think that way. Well, I don't think that way, right? So I look at today's talk more like a workshop, a conversation between what you know and what I know 
and what you experience and what I experience. So it's not a be all and an all absolute kind of lecture. I'm the professor here. I'm talking to you. <laughs> and you listen, right? No, please. You live your life. Many of you, as I was talking to George earlier on, he has many good friends are of Chinese heritage. But do they meet a definition of Chinese culture rated? Somewhat. Me. Or my good friend Bud here and Beth, right? The second, third, fourth generation Chinese Canadian. They have a somewhat totally different understanding of the Chinese culture than I do. Because I lived in Hong Kong and educated in Hong Kong until I was 20. Then I went to Holland for three years. And I came back here and I spent four years in Kelowna. And then I became a counselor from 1990 to 93. And I was president of the nonpartisan association. Some of you old enough we know that name, the NPA. I was president for four or five years. And I did to deal with mostly Western people, understanding how they think, understanding how they operate, and be the president and be able to participate in the decision making of who is going to run for mayor. Who will uh, qualify to run for counselor? Now, if you don't understand the culture, you can't operate like that, right? And that's who I was, who I am. And then I became the vice president of the Toronto Dominion Bank. Now, that bank is called the Toronto Dominion Bank, not for nothing. They always remind me that they are headquartered in Toronto. Western, as Western you can get. In order to get promoted, to become a vice president, I had to learn the Western way of behavior. Again, I'm talking about today mostly of behavior. As a matter of fact, this lecture or this series of slides, I prepared it in around 1997 or 8. To do what? Because at that time, many Hong Kong people immigrated, Chinese people immigrated to Canada. And the bank has to go and grab them in to become a customer of the TD Bank. But there aren't enough senior people at the bank that understand Chinese culture and Chinese people's way of behaving. In this case, in particular, of Hong Kong Chinese, which behave slightly differently from people who are third, fourth generation Chinese Canadians here, or like people like Michael, who came from mainland China. So, what the bank wanted me to do then is to hold a series of talk to the senior branch managers and the senior people at the bank. And this is what it's all about. So this, the purpose of this uh, today's talk is simply to enhance your ability to interact with people who are culturated Chinese. And henceforth, I'm gonna simplify it instead of saying culturated Chinese, this is a mouthful, right? And my pronunciation and my tongue and my, well, sorry. Yeah, that's me, tongue is my name, right? Yeah, so my tongue. And I become tongue-tied. And so, uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, so, so I'll just say Chinese, all right? Simplify it, but you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Not racially Chinese, but simply people who are culturally Chinese, all right? So, so that you have a better chance of interacting with them and understanding. Oh, they did. Um, oh, oh, there. A few caveats. Um, did I pronounce it right? Caveat? Yeah. Okay. So I had a problem. Uh, people who speak uh, Cantonese uh, as a mother tongue have a problem pronouncing the word B. And B. I always start, when I first started, I called them Kuba. Right? So caveat, I like it because I, I put it in, because I want to make sure that when I cover the rest of the uh, talk here is to people know that what I'm talking about and also some of the things that you have to be careful of. The first thing is culture is not static. Culture is dynamic because it continues to change and continues to move forward. So whatever I said today may not be applicable 10 years, 
or people who move forward may not be applicable. For a simple example, the way I dress today, dressing fashion is a part of culture, isn't it? So 30 years ago, I would have put on a tie, right? I would have a matching suit, but look at this. Right? My, they're not, they don't match, so that's why I'm hiding behind it. The lecture here, I'm still a bit conscious. And my shoes would have been Oxford, black and shiny. Culture has changed. So people continue to change. So whatever people tell you, oh, the Chinese are gonna behave that way, uh -uh. it's changing, it's changing. So likewise, the Western culture, if the culture is not moving, not changing, you would still be wearing top hats. Ladies would still wearing those gowns, big ones, right? But it changed, it changed, so remember that. Whatever I talk about today, whatever you experience today is dynamic. It will continue to change. And also when I talk about Chinese culture, look, how many of you have been to China? A lot of you. How big is China? Huge. And the diversity of China is also huge. And not just in China, when I talk about Western culture, right? The culture in BC, the lazy, the, not lazy, I'm sorry, the easygoing, laid back culture compared to Toronto, right? It's moving first. Or to Halifax, where I was chair of the Museum of Immigration of Pier 21. And by the way, if you've never been to Halifax, never been to Pier 21 Immigration, uh, museum, please do go. No more about Canada, no more about immigration. I know some of you have probably come from uh, Europe, Poland, Holland, Germany. Your ancestors may have come through the Pier 21. So the regional diversities. All right, and then not everyone behave at the same norm. So when I say Western people does that, look at culture two, that's the center there is the norm. Culture one center is there, no overlapping of the norm. But within that, there are people, there are overlaps. So there are common grounds and there are far off people on his side or on that side, they don't behave as the norm. So when we interact with people, when you interact with people of a different culture, it doesn't matter, that's why I don't label it, it's called a culture when you move to a different culture, do not fall into the trap of stereotyping. Do not fall into the trap of saying, hey, yeah, I listened to that guy called Tang, and he told me that Chinese behave that way. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. There are people who behave in the norm, there are people who are in the I'm one of those outliers. I totally don't act like a typical culturated Chinese person. When I come to shake your hand, I go my hand and shake and says, but a person who acculturated in the traditional Chinese culture, their handshake is like an automatic car without a clutch. <laughs> I'm glad you guys laugh at my jokes. I love it. Okay. Let me do this. Um, let's talk about the big picture. The big picture that exert its forces onto different cultures and onto how people behave. Now, the first topic here, the, the bulletin here is a bit controversial. People have been debating about it, people reading books about it. And that is geography. China, we're now talking about really early on, 2000 years ago, okay, or some even 3000 years ago. Chinese culture developed in the floodplain of the Yang, the, the Wanghe, Yellow River. That's a floodplain. People at that time when the in Han Dynasty, 400 years of almost continuous prosperity, followed by the Cui Dynasty, and then followed by the Tang Dynasty, another 300 years of progress. <laughs> they don't have to expand. They don't have to fight because the floodplain allowed them to have all the resources they need. So the Chinese culture historically back then 
Now, here's where the con con controversy comes in. It's all developed in peaceful time. They are peaceful people. They look at things from a different mindset versus the Western culture developed in Greek, in Greece, and when they were a lot of war, the area in Europe is mountainous. They have to fight to conquer, to get resources. So that's the original mindset way back when, when the two cultures were originally developed. Now, a lot of people disagree with that and argue with that. I'm not gonna engage in that. I just say, this is some of the theory that people talk about, history. China is one of the only country that has this long history of continuous occupation of the same land mass and basically about the same culture. The British Empire has about continuous under the Williams about a thousand years, which is in a long, long history. But compared to China, you know, 3,000, 1,000, right? So that also impact on the culture, that the culture that we're talking about, Chinese culture, has this long, 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 long history. Okay? And it's continuous. You look at also another thing that's really important, written language of Chinese and Western culture. The Chinese written language is unified. Unified in about 2000 BC by Chen Emperor, Chen Sifang. He was able to conquer China after the five nations, seven warrior countries, and combined together. And make it so that only one writing system of language exists throughout the entire China. The um, Communist Party, Mao Zedong, after 1949, tried to exert power to unify the spoken language. Now, let me explain. What, what does that mean? I, remember I told you I lived in Holland for three years. In Europe, small country like Holland have their own language, Dutch. Who feel the spreken Netherlands? No, no one speaks Dutch here. Oh, yeah. That's oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't remember that. Right? China has the same problem. People in Canton, in Guangzhou, speak Cantonese. Do they? Now, how do you have one language to combine all of those languages? It's simple. I'll give you an example. You know it, and you learn it. The uh, number system, one, two, three, right? Four, five. It does not matter if you speak French, which is under Twanga San, or Dutch, and try Dreitia Fun, or German. No, no, that's not German. That's German. That's German. Or Dutch, Ein Trey Dreitia Fight. You understand it, right? But it's reading the same way. Chinese is the same way. One line. What's that? One. Right? Two lines. What's that? Two. What's that? Three lines. Three. Gosh, you guys are quite. <laughs> you learn Chinese and you can speak, you can read Chinese. But in order to pronounce it, Cantonese is yat yi sa. Mandarin, what my code speaks, yi er san chozo. Sa no san. Haka yi ni san. Right? So China is lucky in that way because this guy, Chun Su Huang, says you have to all write the same way. And also because it's pictorial. So it's one, one, two, three. So you can, like, the numeral one, two, three, that it, you can communicate. So the whole of China. We're able to communicate each other simply by reading the same text, even though they can't converse. And that makes it different. If Europe had developed a language like that, Europe would be much more united. Of course, 
you still have the regional differences. When I was in Holland, I remember there was someone, a linguist, had actually developed a pan Euro language. I actually went and studied it, and I've completely forgotten. But that's, that's that. What's the matter in terms of the, the culture then? Because then the thought process, people can then use the language to learn it the same way and understand each other without needing for translation. So that's important. So that's why in terms of culture, in terms of thinking, philosophy, China is much more homogeneous, even though it has different languages and the regional differences. And also because the Chinese characters are so complex, learn the language is very, very difficult. China has a very high literacy rate before the communists took over. I moved to Hong Kong. My family moved to Hong Kong and grew up in a small village. The small village of about 450 people, there were only about 10 people who can actually read and write. Okay. And because of that, many of the, um, the, the, the people, because they don't read and write, many of the cultures are passed on, much like the First Nation people here by oral history. The practices, what is right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, is all told by stories. That actually has a profound impact on how people behave in China. My mom really didn't went to school, but she has all the understanding of what is the virtual of a Chinese person, what is the good for the Chinese culture or Chinese individual. She taught me a lot, and I still carry many of those learnings. Versus in the Western culture, I think, the role play by written language in terms of passing on culture, in terms of teaching, is much more significant. Now, I'm not saying totally. I'm just saying comparatively, more important in the Western culture of the written language. And the last point here is the cultural characteristics. Uh, I'm gonna have some fun with this one. Um, the first one is uh, Chinese, and the second one is uh, Western, as I understand it. Now, I welcome challenges, your comments uh, later on. The Chinese culture is like water, H2O. Why? Because it has the characteristics of water. It's benign, it nurtures, it's liquid, and it changes forms. The Chinese culture is about like that. It is moving around, sloshing around, but it's always there. When the temperature is cold, when the environment is not friendly, what does water do? turn it into ice, solid, hard. So the Chinese culture can also be that. And Chinese people can also behave like that. Just look during the Second World War, the Japanese invaded China. China as a nation turned into solid ice and fought for eight years. When things get really hot, like when the Mongolians invaded China, they didn't turn into ice and resisted, wasn't successful. Or the Manchurians governed China. What does Chinese culture do? Chinese culture turns into steam and evaporate in the air. It is everywhere. It is there. You cannot mistake it. But when things get cooler, it turns back into water again much like what it is now in China. But China now is ruled by the Communist Party. What does the communist idea come from? Come from Russia. It's not centrally, essentially Chinese. My whole prediction, this is getting to be controversial, is that communists as a foreign ideology will eventually become like Buddhism. Coming into China from India, foreign, but China adopted it. In fact, kicking it in. Like water, dissolve foreign matters. It become part of China. 
So when you hear things people talk about, the Chinese characteristic of communism. Remember that? You heard that? I mean, you heard that. The Chinese characteristic of communism. That's what historically was all about. Western culture. Now, you tell me if I'm right. Western culture is fire. It bursts into flames. It's fantastic. Like the Mongolians, like the, 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 the Ottoman Empire, like the German. It was bright. It was overpowering. It burns, but it consumed a lot of energy. And when fired, consumed all the energy, what did it do? It's extinguished. Extinguished. Right? So you look at the history of the Western culture, all the great empires. Where are they? Where are they? Gone. Gone. Yeah. And some, after a little while, might rise again from the ashes and will burn and will flourish. Right? But unless they start taking on some of the Chinese characteristics of harmony, of not conflict, it might die too. The other part of the Chinese culture, historically, and the world view of the Asian Chinese culture individual is that life is a circle. It goes round. If this life that I'm living now is not a happy one, I look forward to my next life. Because when I die, I go to the underground, not hell, I go to the underground. My soul, my spirit will continue. I have to drink book water, is it? That I have to drink this glass of, 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 of tonic brew, then I will forget everything I did this life. If I've done good things, I'll come back the next life as the lieutenant governor of this province. <laughs> if I've done bad things this life, next life I may come back as a dog. What does it matter? How, how does it impact how a Chinese culturated person behavior? People acculturated in that kind of thinking can suffer a lot without having complained. They say, it's okay. Next life, I'll come back. I have next life. Versus the Western culture of a straight line. You have only one life to live, right? Once you die, you die. You gotta go to heaven, or you gotta go to go to go to get, go to go to hell. And you will you burn in full life until eternity. Until the great savior come and rise more in the judgment day. That's it. Go and shot at it. So you want to do everything you can in this life, right? If you are not right with me, I'm going to punch back because I have no chance. I got to punch you back. I got to kill you, right? You disagree with me? No. I have to fight. Versus... The Chinese culturally the person thinking, oh, you treat me bad? Hey, just wait. You, you wait. Next life, I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna be your father. <laughs> you treat me that bad, next life you're gonna back as a dog. I'll go, you come, and you follow. Huh? So that is really, really interesting. The last I don't know what happened there. Um, is uh, oh. Yeah, that's good. Is that China has been conquered by so many foreign power. Most of the experience that Western society have uh, interact with China was the Mongolian, which is not really Chinese. They are part of China now, Mongolia, and the Mongolian culture is part of the Chinese culture, but Mongolians are very foreign to Chinese. <laughs> The Chinese themselves see themselves as the Tang Dynasty and the Han Dynasty. We still call myself a Han person. I refer to myself as a Han person, not a Chinese person in Chinese. 
was the Hanun. Because that was a gory part of China. That's what Chinese see themselves. But no, Western people don't see Chinese and that is so far, oh, so long ago. They only see Chinese people as the Mongolian uh, in the Yun Dynasty populated by Marco Polo. Right? So most people grew up, or hey, more recently, I grew up watching Hollywood films of Fu Manchu. That's what they understand the Chinese. Now, so there is a huge discrepancy between what most of this generation of Westerners see Chinese and Chinese see themselves. Now, so I talk about the big picture. More specifically. So again, when I say Chinese, is not racially Chinese. When I talk about Chinese, is like people who are acculturated. You could be a fair skinned, blonde hair person, but if you grew up in China, a culture that way, you behave that way. Right? So it's not the color of the skin, it's the content that I'm talking about. Hierarchical. When I grew up, I learned that there are five relationships of people. And they're all out of the five, four are hierarchical. The emperor and the ministers. Emperor holds absolute power, the ministers have no power. Vis a vis the emperor. Father and son. Now, in the Western culture, father and son is equal, right? No, no, no. Not in the Chinese culture. Father has absolute power. In fact, if you ask a Korean person of the last generation, Korean is learn their the culture from China in the, in, in the Tang Dynasty. When they eat dinner, if the father does not start eating, nobody allowed to eat. And when the father finished, dropped his chopstick, got up, nobody eat dinner. That's what father and son. When I was young, unless I'm spoken to, I do not talk to my father. It's really into my heart. That's how it is. Okay? Brother, the brothers. Chinese, there's a difference between an elder brother and younger brother. To this day, when I see my older brother, I kind of stand like this. I never treat him as equal. To this day. To this day. Because he is one that I need to respect. He is older than me. He knows more about life than me. And therefore, I have to show my respect. And then the fourth one, most of you would disagree with, would disagree with me, is husband and wife. Ha. Husband would be the one that says, this is where you go. I make the decision. Wife, you belong to the kitchen. That's how it was. That's how I grew up. As a matter of fact, I was never even allowed to go into the kitchen. Whenever I go in the kitchen, I got kicked out. My mom says kitchen is not is only for women, not for men. So to this day, I still don't know how to cook. <laughs> nice slice, huh? <laughs> I'm blessed. Um, and then the last is friends. Only friends are equal. Even friends, an older, a friend who's older, you show deference. And so that's how it is. People who are born, raised, and culturated in the Chinese value are used to hierarchical. That has behavioral impacts later on in life, even to this day. Me, right? Western is more equality. Everyone is born equal. Right? So it doesn't matter. And when I first came here, you know what? When I hear people call the dead by the first name, I go, what? That's the father. And then I find out they call the granddads by the first name too. Man, I can't believe it. My first year UBC, I went to UBC. Nine o'clock, everyone's playing around. This is UBC first year, okay? 
sociology course. Running around, and the prof comes in. No, that's not uh, so young. There's the arts one course. The prof comes in, uh, Murray Smith. I don't remember him. Murray, I come in with a white gown, long white gown, long hair. And I find out later he was a, 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 a draft dodger from the United States. Uh, <laughs> and he comes in and he goes into the blackboard. He wrote Murray Smith. And it says, Class, uh, I'm your professor. I stood up. Jack, straight. Good morning, sir. <laughs> My class people said, Who is this idiot? <laughs> Who is this idiot? What does he do? That's how I was brought up. You respect your teacher, he is an authority. You respect, and show respect as you got up and you say, Good morning, you bow. That's the first lesson I learned about the Western culture. Okay, you don't have to show respect that way. Chinese emphasize more on community. Western individual. Very obvious, right? Give you one example. My name. I've been introduced as Tang Chen. In fact, I also have a um, first name. My first name is Chi, C-H-I. Tang Chi Tang Chen. But when I introduce myself to my Chinese friends, I call myself, or well, people like Michael, I say, my name is Chen Chi Tang. What's the difference? Western nature, Western culture, individual first. Tang, you want, I want you to know me as Tang. If I know you more, I will stuck my tongue out so you remember my mouth. But we don't know each other that well yet, so I won't do that. <laughs> and then my family. But in Chinese, I want my family name comes first. In fact, that family name, Chan, is not just my family name, but my entire clan's name. Everyone in that clan has the name Chan. It's like Irish, you know, McDonald, or McGregor, and all that. But the clan carries a lot more. In fact, in the olden days, you actually introduce yourself as I am Canton Chan. I grew up in Guangzhou, Canton, uh, that area. So the community comes first. And I've got my first name, or the middle name in this case, Chi. What does that mean? Why? because that is my generation name. Now that tradition is now not as common in China. And there's some historical reason for it. I'm not going to do it. That is my generation name. What does it mean by that? All my brothers has the same name. So my older brother is Chi Chu. My younger brother is Chi Fun and Chi Ching. So when, and not only that, my father's brothers, if they have sons, they all have the same name, Chi. Okay? What's the matter? Because then when I look at people, when they introduce themselves, I know that I need to bow to him or he's equal to me because my parent also have his generational name, which is Lai. So if I saw people with Chan Lai something, like my dad's name is Chan Lai Tong. So if it's Chan Lai Yun, then I know, oh, he's my elder, I bow to him. And he has a younger name of my son's generation, then I expect him to bow to me. Ah. And that's important because that's what community is all about, right? We talk, the Chinese people talk more about in old days, even today, talk about responsibility. In the Western culture, you talk more about rights. Now, not to say that you don't talk about responsibility, but comparatively, what is placed in more emphasis? Remember that graph I showed you, right? The norm doesn't mean that they don't exist. They don't overlap. They do, but it's the emphasis. Check. Western, Western culture talk about distinctiveness. I want to be distinct. I don't be individual. The Chinese culture individual behave in a way that's most harmonious. They talk about conforming to the same kind of 
uh, situation rather than challenging, rather than uh, being creative. Now, not to say that Chinese culturated people do not are not creative. They are. But in terms of the daily interaction, in terms of how they would behave in a certain uh, situation, if they have a choice, they would pick conformity over individualistic. I still remember uh, my younger daughter uh, went to uh, elementary school, uh, no, play school and comes home one day. And she says to, 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 to me, I said, that, that, that tomorrow is show and tell day. I said, what does what, that, that mean, All right? I have to show and tell my classmates what is good, what's best of my household. And I said, no, 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 daughter. We try to be humble. We try to be conforming. We don't want to show off. My daughter said, no, everybody's showing off. I can't not do that. So I have to learn the Western way. It's off the Western way. And I got to teach her to say, bring something out. I don't remember exactly what I asked her to bring out. Faith is another concept that you probably heard a lot about, right? They talk about Asian people, they talk about faith. What does faith really mean? Faith is simply all of that about hierarchical community, harmonious conformity. If you follow those, you're giving person faith. If you are looking at uh, Bud, I know he is a former judge, Supreme Court judge. I show him my respect. Okay, I'm giving him faith. That really is just like respect. Conrad is the president here, so when he stood up, I kind of like, okay, I better sit back down because he's the president. That's giving him faith. That giving him the proper respect. You don't challenge people openly. That's giving him faith. But what's that? That is harmonious. You don't want to have conflict, right? The Eastern culture is also very much of ritualistic, governed. <clears throat> so when you see people of Abyssinia, you go slowly and you bow. Does that still do that? No, as I said, culture is dynamic. People don't do that as much anymore. They still do that, they still do. Watch the um, uh, Chinese uh, television uh, or, or news class of Chinese television. The politicians, no matter how senior they are, when they finish the speaking, they go to the side of the lectern, and what do they do? They bow. Huh? I watched um, Joe Biden's uh, 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 speech of uh, the nation. Did he ever bow? <clears throat> Did he uh, bow to the Speaker of the House? Nah. Question? Culture? Eastern culture. Um, I'm watching my time here. Let's have fun. I'm having so much fun. I hope you guys do. <laughs> I still got a few more. Um, so community, all right? Context is very important in the uh, Chinese culture. Western is more content. Even in law, even application, Way, 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 way back, Chinese people talk about law, is that the legal system does not extend beyond the scholars. Because above that, they should be governed by ritual, not, not by the legal system. So many of the Chinese people already lived through many years, many generations, that they understand the law could be not applicable. And because law, if there's somebody's son and the father is a high uh, 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 ranking individual, uh, the law may not apply to this individual equally. That's in the folk law. That's what I learned, right? I still have people who came to me when I was a banker. They came here to sign a contract. And then they just decided, nah, nah, I'm not gonna fulfill it. I said, hey, you signed a contract. It's a legal document. I said, nah, I just signed it because I want to sign it. Because that's the system that they were living in. Right or wrong? Nah, it's just context, right? Does everybody does that way? No, no, I'm just talking about some would do that, okay? And then also because they're living in here, they have better well remember to learn it this way. I'll tell you a story. 
Okay, this is not a public story. So uh, if you hear it, uh, don't repeat it. Uh, but I'm going to hide some of it. A very major Canadian bank went to China, set up shop. And they have the top person, people who does not understand or speak Chinese at all, understand a little bit of China uh, in terms of their culture and behavior. So they hire a Harvard educated or MIT, I forgot which, switch, and uh, speak good English and understand Chinese, grew up now, and hire him as a 2IC. So they went and they thought making loans to everybody. And then this guy resigned. So the bank went after trying to collect loans. And the Chinese the person on the other hand, now I'm talking about here is 1991, uh, 92. Uh, when I was still a banker. Um, that was when China, early days, starting to, to grow. So, okay, so things have changed now. And so uh, this guy, the factory uh, guy says to the, uh, the bank's resident, no, I signed a contract, but I didn't sign it with you. I signed with the other guy, he's gone. I'm not giving you back the money. I'm not under those terms, right? So those kind of cultural contact things is important. Chinese people who are culturally that way care more, a lot more about feeling. I grew up, when I speak, I would look at people's face and see whether they are agreeing with me or disagree with me before I continue. But I soon learned that I don't have to do that anymore when I live in the Western culture. I have to stay my ground, I have to be assertive, I have to continue to say, say my points because I don't do that. A Western culturated person would look at me as a weak person, not as a respectful person, not as someone who wants to be harmonious, but as a weak person that has no spine. So I have to operate. In fact, I do. When I speak in Chinese, I behave slightly different than when I speak in English. And that's how I got to be a vice president of a bank, right? Big deal. I was the first Chinese Canadian to become a vice president of bank. Very proud of that. Which I should not really be as a Chinese person. I should be humble. I'm not going to be the other. It was just I was lucky in the right place on the right time. Oh, and, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. I don't answer this. Uh, you guys probably know more about that. Eye contact, facial expression, body annotation, gesture, interpersonal difference, as you know, interpersonal distance. <laughs> when, I be, when I run for, for uh, yeah, Conrad's looking at the watch. When I ran for office, you know, they taught me that uh, you had to be friendly to people, you embrace them. And if it was a lady, you got to touch the boot check, both sides of the cheek, right? Right? That's totally, uh, <clears throat> can't do that. You know? So the first time I practiced it, you know what? I go, she goes that way, and I go, I kiss that lady. Lucky is a very pretty lady, full in the mouth. <laughs> and shake, I mentioned that already, right? So many uh, people, uh, culture in the Chinese culture, handshakes is just, you know, they go up, but they're ladies. They go with the hands like this, let you shake it, right? <laughs> but things change. Group uh, um, dynamic formula, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do's and don'ts. Uh, to be open, be curious, okay? To pathetic, when you listen, when you listen to people, listen to their feelings. Listen to why they say the kind of things they say. Don't use stereotypes. A lot of people say, oh, it's Chinese, that's why you're saying that. No, 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 no. He's an individual, culturally in the Chinese culture. Listen carefully, right? And uh, be flexible, right? Um, here's the important thing. This is called the Harry's uh, Square. When I know the Diversity Council is trying to get people to interact more with each other, bring more people in, in order to bring more people in, you have to learn more about them. Look here, this is no, you know, and the other person know. You want to expand that square so you can talk to each other. 
when I first came here, I tried to expand my knowledge of a Western person. So I wanted to learn about uh, hockey, right? I learned more about the Western cuisine. I learned more about what a salad is. I didn't even know what a salad is. So first time I went to this uh, uh, lady's home um, and, 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 and uh, Jane Hayward is her name because my English teacher told me that, you know, to learn to speak English, the best way to do is to date a blue iPhone. Girl, so I follow her suggestion. Jane was my girlfriend, no, friend. I went to her home. Mother says, well, Tung, we're gonna offer lunch for uh, chowder. I said, okay, clam chowder. Yeah, I know what it is. Uh, would you like Boston or Manhattan? I look at her and I said, well, I like clam. I don't mind where you cut them. <laughs> and so, she, okay, it's so not I have a sense of humor. So she then says, I'm gonna have you. So the salad was right in front of that, right? A bowl of green salad, uncooked vegetable. I grew up, remember, in a small village in Hong Kong? Uncooked vegetable is for the pigs. Human consume only cooked vegetable. So I looked at it. Mrs. Hayward says to me, he says, Tung, would you like some dressing? And I said, dressing? <laughs> no thanks, I'm warming up. And then she says, no, 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 no. I'd like to know if you want Italian or French dressing. I look at myself and say, mm. no, mine's made in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. So in order for you to expand your circle, you know, if you feel comfortable to talk to each other, expand that. Learn more. Learn more. Right? Yeah. No need for summer. So I say thank you. I say thank you. Merci beaucoup. This is uh, Canada. We're supposed to be bilingual. I went and learned French. Alliance Francaise de Hong Kong. And je dis petit peu français. So merci beaucoup, Madame Monsieur. Thank <laughs> you.